hi, we did it. So I'm not frozen. Wow. Most adults should be screened for anxiety. That's according to the Department of Health and Human Services. Gee, you think they finally realized most of us should be treated for anxiety? In a new report issued earlier this week, doctors warned that since COVID, Americans have been operating under incredible emotional stress. Really? It took a doctor to figure that one out. The HHS is also recommending that everyone under the age of 65 get tested for depression and anxiety. If you're under 65, go get tested. This is America. If you're under 65, you should throw yourself off a cliff. That's how things work here in America. Apparently, they've just discovered that we're stressed out and it's time to test us about, uh, for our anxiety and our stress. Yes, uh, here are your test results, Mr. Feldman. You suffer from anxiety and there's nothing you can do about it because you live in America and you'd have to go out of pocket for your mental health issues. But we did our job. We tested you for anxiety. And remember, there's no stigma. Do not be stigmatized by your anxiety. You should not be ashamed of your mental illness. 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 And yeah. Remember, we can't do anything about your mental illness, but please don't be stigmatized by it. That's America. Don't be stigmatized by your mental illness, but good luck getting it treated. Well, here's a heartwarming story coming to us from Kansas. I like this story. There's always bad news. Sometimes there's good news. Jackson County Sheriff's Deputy Matthew Hannes has been fired uh, for hog tying a 14 year old autistic child, handcuffing his arms behind his back, then placing him in the back seat of the deputy's patrol car. And then, without any warning, surprise, Sheriff's Deputy Matthew Hannes tased the the 12 year old, I'm sorry, 12 year old autistic boy. And did I say 14? I got that wrong. I apologize. It was a 12 year old autistic boy. I, I'm, yes, so he tased the 10 year old and it was all captured on the officer's dashboard cam, uh, which you can uh, see this uh, December for Roseanne Barr's new comedy special on Fox Nation. She has a new comedy special on Fox Nation and uh, and play funny videos like a, a police hog tying a 12 year old autistic boy and then surprising him with a, a taser. Uh, Officer Honus was fired. We're just finding out about this, but he is allowed to still work for other police departments Jackson County paid Officer Honus $23.55 an hour, but that included benefits like getting to take out all your frustrations on a 14-year-old, I'm sorry, a 12-year-old autistic child and hog-tying him and then uh, hitting him with a, a taser. Sweet story, isn't it? My apologies, it's a 12-year-old, not a 14-year-old story. Jesus. Thomas Lane pleaded guilty to second-degree manslaughter after he admitted to holding down George Floyd's legs while Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee into Floyd's neck for nearly 10 minutes while Floyd shouted, I can't breathe. On Wednesday, the state of Minneapolis sentenced former police officer Lane to three years in prison. Lane is currently serving a 30-month sentence inside a federal prison for violating George Floyd's civil rights. Officer Lane's attorney asked the judge for leniency because Officer Lane, I'm not making this up, has a newborn baby. Isn't that sweet? I wonder if Officer Lane was in the delivery room reminding his wife to breathe while he pressed her neck against the cement floor. He had a child. All that's been going on for the past two years, he decided to have a child. Another example of why everyone 
who's a man should be an absentee dad. We don't need fathers. Well, more good news. Taco Bell announced that they will test market for a limited time only in Dayton, Ohio, carne asada steak made with Beyond Meat. People who have tried it say they can't tell the difference between the fake and the real diarrhea. Beyond Meat has suspended their chief operating officer, Doug Ramsey, after he was arrested in a parking garage near Razorback Stadium at the University of Arkansas after he allegedly got into a fight with the driver of a Subaru who accidentally bumped into the tire of Ramsey's Bronco. Ramsey allegedly punched out the driver's back window. And then as a fight ensued, Ramsey allegedly bit off a piece of the man's nose. Sounds like Ramsey needs to try Beyond Boogers. Obviously, the CFO of Beyond Meat has that rare condition where he eats other people's boogers instead of his own. That's why I always cook with Beyond Boogers. By the way, Ramsey had been with Beyond Meat for less than a year. He worked previously for 30 years for Tyson, which manufactures fake imitation chicken. You uh, you should try a Tyson roaster. I swear it tastes like actual fake chicken. I'm surprised after 30 years at Tyson, this guy Ramsey didn't wring the guy's neck and smear avian flu all over him. The Death and uh, Custody Reporting Act of 2013 mandates that our Department of Justice gathers statistics from state and federal prisons to count the number of inmates who die in custody. Well, a new report from the General Accounting Office says that our Justice Department is not keeping track, and they forgot to count close to 1,000 deaths in prisons, jails, or police custody for 2021. So let me make this clear here. 1,000 people didn't die in our prisons, jails, or in police custody in 2021. 1,000 is the number the Department of Justice missed in the count. In other words, so many people are dying in our prison system, there are too many to count. You've heard of rounding errors? This is a rounding up era. The DOJ is rounding up the number of people getting rounded up and dying in police custody, in our jails, in prisons. Here in America, Supreme Court Justices, uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia Thomas, has agreed to meet with the January 6th Select Committee to discuss her involvement in trying to overturn the 2020 presidential election. The committee reportedly has texts between Virginia and John Eastman. He's a former clerk to Justice Thomas, who was implementing a plan to pressure Vice President Mike Pence into not certifying the election by bringing in separate sets of electors to Washington on January 6. Virginia Thomas, seen here dressed as Lady Liberty, or a male moose during rutting season. I don't know. I'm going to go with male moose during rutting season. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing her because they say it's inappropriate for the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice to be batshit crazy. The House passed the Presidential Election Reform Act this week, which stipulates that each state's electoral count reflects the popular vote, not the state legislature. The bill also says the vice president has only a ceremonial duty in certifying the elections, which you know suggests that John Eastman, that attorney who tried to hold up the certification process, may not have broken any laws. Seems like you have to. Uh, if you have to fix the old laws, I don't know if anybody is breaking the old ones. I don't know. Only nine Republicans voted in favor of the electoral reform bill, all of whom are not returning to Congress in 2023. 
A similar bill is being worked on in the Senate with 10 Republicans reportedly on board. As to comment on this new electoral reform bill, Virginia Thomas said, can't talk, it's dinner time, and I'm about to make the chicken and NyQuil for my husband. Apparently that's a thing, cooking chicken with NyQuil. Yes, chicken and NyQuil. The kids are doing it. You still get bird flu, but none of the headache, fever, body aches, sinus pressure, sore throat, and runny nose. Runny pants, always, but uh, no runny nose. Speaking of runny pants, Chipotle, Chipotle, Chipotle. Uh, after investigators in New Jersey discovered the fast food giant committed more than 30,000 labor violations against children, including long hours and no meal breaks for children, Chipotle has agreed to pay a $7.5 million fine. Two years ago, Massachusetts ordered Chipotle, Chipotle to cough up $1.4 million in fines for similar offenses against children, against children. Here in New York City, last year, Chipotle was ordered to pay 13,000 New York workers a total of $20 million after Chipotle was found guilty of violating local labor laws. Back in 2017, the New York City Council passed the Fair Work Week law which says fast food employees are entitled to know their schedules two weeks in advance. The railroad company should try that. So on Monday, the city reported, that's a local website that covers New York City, the city reports that hearings were held in New York City, revealing that despite paying these enormous fines, Chipotle is still violating the fair week Fair Work Week law. Uh, this is the uh, head of Chipotle. Very good looking guy, right? Very healthy looking guy. Uh, yeah. Where am I? Hang on. Don't panic. Brian Nickel. That's, that's his name. He's chairman and CEO of Chipotle Mexican Grill. And according to the AFL-CIO's executive pay watch, in 2021, Brian Nickel earned $17,880,580. Or Mr. Nickel was paid 40,000. Right, I was going to make a nickel joke. I'm sorry. Uh, he earned $17,880,000 thousand five hundred eighty dollars i'm sorry i made a mistake he stole seventeen million eight hundred eighty thousand five hundred eighty dollars by withholding wages and working children long hours and denying them meal breaks children makes close to 18 million dollars a year but the children working for chipotle don't get meal breaks and uh, work long hours like it's some novel by Charles Dickens. That's how he made $18 million. By the way, I looked up Chipotle stock. I'm not, this is the God's honest truth. No dividends. Chipotle does not pay dividends. Zero. It screws the workers and the investors. There's your end stage capitalism, right? We've hired kids and pay them next to nothing literally nothing. Uh, but how do we trim costs even more so I can pay myself more than $18 million a year? I got it. Screw the investors, right? No dividends. That way we pump all the profits into me. Piece of shit, Brian Nickel, chairman and CEO of Chipotle, who earns $18 million a year working children 
overtime and not paying them for overtime and violating labor laws, not giving children meal breaks. He's probably helping those kids because those meal breaks probably would have meant they're eating something from Chipotle and they could come down with another case of Listeria, which Chipotle is famous for. So maybe maybe it's a good idea not to give those kids meal breaks over at Chipotle. Brian Nickel, chairman and CEO. Look at his face. Know the name. That is Brian Nickel, chairman and CEO of Chipotle. That is the uh, CEO of Chipotle. You know, whenever I order from Chipotle, the first thing I always ask right after the food arrives is, why did I do this to myself? Why, why did I do this? I'm going to end up smelling like Meghan McCain's car seat for a week. Then after I ask that question, the second question I ask is, how many ants can there be in one burrito? It's a good question. It's a great question. Many people have asked, how many ants can there possibly be in one Chipotle burrito? Well, it turns out, this is interesting, there are 2.5 million ants for every single human on the planet. The National Academy of Sciences published results from this year's ant census. Yes, there's an ant census. So if there are 2.5 million ants for every single human on the planet, how many ants are there? Want to figure it out? There are about 8 billion people on the planet Earth. There's 2.5 million ants for every human. Give up. The answer is 20 quadrillion. There are 20 quadrillion ants on the planet Earth. Now, in all fairness, because some parts of the American Constitution haven't been updated for centuries, when they take the ant census, black ants are only counted as three-fifths of an ant. So that's why your numbers were probably off. But if you count black ants as three-fifths of an ant, then the number of ants is 20 quadrillion. 20 quadrillion ants. How much is that? Uh, a lot. Uh, by the way, that, that's a rounding. It's, it's 20 quadrillion, give or take three or four bajillion. And uh, a bajillion, by the way, is 100 Brazilian. And a Brazilian is very painful. Very, very painful. And uh, but, but we podcast hosts do to look beautiful for you. It's, it's uh, I don't know why I do it. It's horrible. 20 quadrillion ants, according to the National Academy of Sciences, 20 quadrillion ants weigh 70 megatons, but that's with their shoes and belt on. America is fascinated by ants, especially worker ants. We study worker ants because they're mostly female and never form unions. Unlike the 274 workers at a Home Depot in Philadelphia who filed a petition this week with the National Labor Relations Board to form a union. A spokesman for Home Depot said that they are aware of Home Depot Workers United, but said, quote, we do not believe unionization is the best solution for our associates, our associates. They are not your associates or your partners or your teammates or your colleagues. They are your employees. Calling someone a manager doesn't make them management. That's one of the ways these box stores get out of paying overtime. They make someone a manager and suddenly they're considered management, so they don't get paid like ordinary employees. They're not entitled to overtime pay. Any, don't take any job where you're called a, a partner or an associate. Uh, workers are gaining leverage. They're quitting. Uh, and if they don't get paid what they deserve, they quit silently. They just do as little work as possible. 
And they're demanding unions like the workers at Home Depot or Amazon or Starbucks. And that's where the Federal Reserve comes in. Fed Chair Jerome Powell is getting serious about inflation, very serious about inflation, uh, but only wages, you know, wage inflation, because there's nothing he can do about the other inflation. That's the only thing he can, only inflation he could fight <clears throat> is wage inflation. Now, this isn't complicated. They want you to think inflation is complicated, but it's not. The cause of inflation is the following. The war in Ukraine driving up the price of food. COVID and climate change creating supply chain issues and corporations posting record profits by taking advantage of the inflation narrative and then raising prices, okay? Check out second quarter earnings for the S&P 500. I talked about this on the show last month. Corporate America did very well in the second quarter. And they don't call it price gouging, they call it pricing power. That's an actual term Wall Street uses, pricing power. It's price gouging. And inflation is caused because our Justice Department doesn't enforce antitrust laws. So places like Home Depot have a monopoly. When you need wood, there's no place else to go. It's like, it's like marriage, you know? I need wood. She has the monopoly. That's what causes inflation, pricing power and rent. We've talked about this. Nobody believes me when I tell them. Look it up. One third of inflation is rent. One third is rent. By the way, half of people who rent live at or below the poverty line. So you want to fight inflation? Pass a national rent control law. And one third of inflation is under control. But no, that's not what our Fed did this week. Jerome Powell, Jerome Powell could have said, look, I'm chairman of the Fed. We have to bring inflation down. But I, I'm also mandated to keep unemployment down. But I don't care about workers. I just care about the bankers. But he could have said, what he could have said is, look, we need to bring inflation down. I recommend we end the war in Ukraine. We do something about climate catastrophe, uh, you know, and COVID interrupting the supply chains. We should break up these monopolies so there's some competition when it comes to pricing and rent control. We should have national rent control because one third of inflation is in rent. Is That's what he could have done to tackle inflation, but instead he decided to raise interest rates to 3.25%, the highest level since the Great Depression. This will have no effect on inflation whatsoever. What it will do is bring down wage inflation. When he made the announcement, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said, this is a bitter pill and we need some tough medicine. This is what we have to do to tame inflation. And he specifically warned of, quote, steep job losses, see? He knows what he's doing and he knows who he's working for. He's creating job losses. That's all he's doing. More job losses, right? Then the labor market can't demand to go union or wage increases. That's how he's taming inflation by screwing the workers. Make no mistake. Oh, it's Jackie Martling. I wonder what he has to say. Uh, let me, can't talk. Okay, it's Jackie Martling. My phone never rings and I get a call from Jackie Martling. Jackie the Joke Man Martling called me. I, I should turn my ringer off. London Lee might decide to call. Um, anyway, uh, so make no mistake about this. Uh, this country 
wants you working for little to no money. That is the plan. Well, the Dow responded yesterday by dropping 500 points. Like I said, one of the big drivers of inflation that nobody is talking about is climate catastrophe. Crops are dying in the American West as the American West suffers from the worst drought in 1,200 years. Farmers can't grow food. So what happens when there's a shortage of food? If there's limited supply, but there's a lot of demand, Economics 101, the price of food goes up. Climate change catastrophe is causing the price of food to go up. In March, Sarah Bloom Raskin, she's the wife of Congressman Jamie Raskin, Sarah Bloom Raskin withdrew her nomination to sit on the seven-member Federal Reserve Board after Senator Joe Manchin said he would not vote for her. Why? Because Joe Manchin is the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in Washington, D.C. And Raskin said she believes the Fed should use its regulatory authority to forbid banks from lending to oil and gas companies. That's how you protect uh, the dollar. That's how you fight inflation, by telling banks not to lend money to oil and gas companies. Keep it in the ground. That was too much for the Republicans and, of course, Joe Manchin. Well, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite Congress people, and that would be Michigan's Rashida Tlaib. I love Rashida Tlaib. She is the first Palestinian female to serve in Congress. She's a lawyer. And this week, the bankers came to Capitol Hill to testify, probably to get some money. They always like to get money. And uh, the bankers came to Capitol Hill to testify. And Congressman, Congresswoman Tlaib had some pointed questions for a piece of shit, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon. She had some questions for this piece of shit about his company being the single largest investor in oil and gas. I think this is it. Please answer with a simple yes or no. Does your bank have a policy against funding new oil and gas products, Mr. Diamond? Absolutely not. And that would be the road to hell for America. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine, sir. You know what? Everybody that got relief from student loans has a bank account with your bank should probably re take out their account and close their account. The fact that you're not even there to help relieve many of the folks that are in debt, extreme debt because of student loan debt and you're out there criticizing it. Ms. Frazier, how about you? Uh, we will continue to invest in uh, and support clients who are investing in fossil fuels and in uh, in helping them transition to cleaner energies. And Mr. Uh, Monahan? We are helping our clients make a transition, and that means we're, we're lending to both oil and gas companies and to new energy companies and helping monitor their course towards the standards you're talking about. Yeah, Mr. Shaw? That's Excuse me, uh, the same thing as Mr. Moynihan said. Yeah, I, I'm not going to ask you, Mr. Diamond, because you obviously don't care about working class people in frontline communities like ours that are facing huge amounts of high rates of asthma, respiratory issues, and so much more. Cancer rates are so high among my communities that I represent. So I'm not going to even ask you if you're committing to ending financing and new oil and gas projects. But Ms. Frazier, Mr. Monahan, Mr. Shea, we are living through a climate crisis today. And a commitment to net zero requires a commitment to ending fossil fuel financing. It is important because I want you all to know at the end, we're going to pay the cost of the public health impact. These are people that you're supposed to be serving. That is uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Everybody should donate to her. We need more Congress people like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. 
Did that story get covered? You have a United States, a sitting United States Congresswoman telling people to boycott J.P. Morgan Chase because of the way they deal with student loans and because they are the largest investor in oil and gas. A United States Congressperson just said to boycott J.P. Morgan Chase. That's a big story. I don't know. It's up to you to decide whether or not you're going to pull what little money you have uh, out of J.P. Morgan Chase. But why would you keep your money in J.P. Morgan Chase if they think the, the road to hell, that's what Jamie Dimon said, it's the road to hell. Stop investing in fossil fuels. What a piece of shit. This is the guy, by the way, he still he was the he helped create the Great Recession back in 2008. He's still there. He's still in charge of J.P. Morgan Chase. Well, yeah, there's some good Congress people uh, that we should pay attention to. And there's some. Uh, some good uh, guys running for office, and I hope they make it. I hope they make it to Congress. My fingers are crossed. I usually vote for Democrats, but I'm a patriot, and I like this guy, J.R. Majewski. J.R. Majewski. How can you not love a guy who's anti-Semitic but has the word Jew in his last name? J.R. Majewski is running for uh Marcy Captor's seat in Ohio. She's the Congresswoman Democrat. We had her on the show. And J.R. Majewski, God bless you, has been endorsed by Donald Trump because J.R. Majewski was there at the Capitol on January 6th, probably, you know, looking for, you know, measuring the drapes. I'm sure he wasn't an insurrectionist. He just showed he's running for office. He was probably measuring Marcy Captor's office for the drapes. Uh, he's a QAnon supporter. And more importantly, J.R. Majewski, and I'm not making this up, was a, as still is, a hip hop rapper who can turn a phrase like last Saturday night when he opened for Trump in Youngstown, Ohio. This is uh, J.R. Majewski. I'll be the working member of Congress that's going to be the tip of the spear. And I'm going to turn that Green New Deal brown like the turd it is. Yeah, that is the rapier wit of the battle hardened rapier wit of J.R. Majewski, the man that I mentioned he's a veteran. He has seen J.R. Majewski has seen things no man should see like himself naked coming out of the shower. J.R. Majewski fought in Afghanistan, and he doesn't like to talk about it. Here he is last year. He doesn't like to talk about his military service. You have to coax it out of him. Like all heroes, J.R. Majewski is very humble. Here he is talking on some podcast. Just doesn't want to talk about his military service. He, he saw things. Did you serve in Afghanistan? Yes, I did. How many tours? One. What what year were you there? What years? Uh, 2000, 2002, 2003. Wow. So you served right at, right at the beginning. Yeah. What was that experience like? Um, tough. Tough. I don't like talking about my military experience. Not, 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 that, um, not that we've said too much. I just don't... I don't really like to... I really don't like to divulge a lot of things about the military because, you know, they're to me, you know, it was a, it was a tough time in life. Um, you know, the military wasn't easy, but in retrospect, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. And, you know, I do it all over again, but, you know, out of respect of, you know, many things, you know, I, I you know, my answer to most people when they ask about my military services, you know, I served, I served honorably and, um, I fought for this country for a lot of months over in the Middle East. And, uh, so did a lot of people that went with me. And, you know, when I see all these things that are going on today, I mean, if I could, if I could, uh, put my BDUs back on, if I wasn't so chubby, I'd, I'd probably, uh, I'd probably try to find a way to do it. 
What a guy. Wow. Thank you for your service, J.R. Majewski. Thank you. You're part of America's treasure. J.R., you know, he, he has in the past described combat conditions in Afghanistan as, quote unquote, tough. He says he was forced to go 40 days without a shower, but he said it was worth it. He heard the call after 9-11 and he went to Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, J.R. Majewski is reticent. You can tell he's reticent about his service. But occasionally he thinks of his fellow comrades and the sacrifices they all made. And, you know, last year when Joe Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, J.R. Majewski, veteran, war combat veteran, felt Biden had bungled it. So, J.R. Majewski broke a promise to himself and felt that he had to tweet about his military service. It was difficult for him. You see how humble he is. Uh, and he wasn't doing this for himself. He was doing it for his comrades in arms. And this is his tweet. And it's from August 25th, 2021. I'm a veteran of OEF. I'm gladly, I'd gladly suit up and go back to Afghanistan tonight and give my best to save those Americans who were abandoned. Why isn't our president all in? And, and he puts, he puts president in, in quotation marks because he doesn't really think Joe Biden won the election because he's an election denier, but he has those right. You know, he's a veteran. He fought for this country in Afghanistan. He was there, he, he, he's tough 40 days without a shower in Afghanistan. J.R. Majewski put it all on the line and he doesn't wanna talk about his service, but you know, he feels Joe Biden bungled it and he's compelled to speak out against the president, even though as a member of the military, he swore an oath to obey his commander in chief. And that must have been very difficult for combat veteran J.R. Majewski, who, you know, who swore an oath to obey his president, but then he had he had no choice but to criticize his quote un, his quote unquote president. Soldiers are not supposed to do that. And when they do criticize, when war, when combat veterans speak out against a president, it carries much weight. J.R. Majewski carries much weight. And when J.R. Majewski says he feels that Joe Biden wasn't all in the way J.R. Majewski was all in in Afghanistan, people need to criticize the commander in chief. We need to win. We needed to win in Afghanistan. And J.R. Majewski knows that if you're running for office, you don't run with one arm tied behind our back. That's why we lost in Afghanistan. And he's running for office to win, which means that once again, combat veteran J.R. Majewski had to compromise his principles and be a bit of a braggart and remind voters that unlike his opponent, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, he, J.R. Majewski, heard the clarion call to defend freedom overseas right after 9-11. And here is his latest video. Here is his latest video. And this must be hard for him because he's reticent about his military service. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to return this country back to its former glory. And if I gotta kick down doors, well, that's just what patriots do. When I'm elected, I won't bow to establishment pawns or power-hungry radicals. I will hold my own and demand that once again, America stands independent and strong like the country that I fought for. Yes, like the country J.R. Majewski fought for. Speak softly, but carry a big AR-15. That was a big AR-15. That was like midlife crisis, I can't get it up, sized AR-15. And the guy wants to win. And campaigning for office is a battle. It is. And campaigning for office, they come at you. 
They come at you and Jr. he's battle toughened, J.R. Majewski, because he served in Afghanistan. He's, he's a combat veteran and, and he went 40 days without a shower. So unlike the other weak willed milksops running for office, he's a candidate and he's prepared to take incoming like this. Right. Duck and cover. Ohio GOP House candidate has misrepresented his military service. So the Associated Press looked into his military record. Apparently, J.R. Majewski uh, didn't serve in Afghanistan. He didn't serve in Iraq. J.R. Majewski never saw any combat. But he did go 40 days without a shower starting last August, and tomorrow will be day 41. So there's that. J.R. Majewski, 41 days without a shower because he's tough. And this is a hatchet job. You know, why, why is the Associated Press digging into J.R. Majewski's military records? Doesn't he respect our troops? I mean, that, that is so unpatriotic to look into J.R. Majewski's military records. Uh, first of all, he was in the military. Uh, he served most of his time in Japan, which I believe America fought in World War II. So technically, J.R. Majewski did serve in an American military theater of operation. And he didn't serve in Iraq or Afghanistan, but right after 9-11, he served in Qatar, where he spent six months loading and unloading Air Force planes. That's kind of like, you know, you know, he's CIA. You know he was in Afghanistan, but he can't talk about it. He's CIA. He, he you know, he, he can't talk. I mean, come on. The guy was at the Capitol on January 6th, big follower of QAnon. Uh, he says 2020 was rigged. So why all of a sudden would he lie about his military record? It just doesn't make any sense that a guy who would be at the Capitol on January 6th a follower of QAnon, somebody who thinks Joe Biden isn't a legitimate president, why would he lie about his military record? It makes absolutely no sense. I'm still voting for J.R. Majewski. Uh, I don't live in Pennsylvania, but apparently you don't need to live in Pennsylvania to run for office there or vote. So I'm voting for J.R. Majewski. I think he's fabulous. I do. He didn't lie about his military record. And I think the Associated Press owes him and all, all the, the soldiers out there who didn't serve an apology. All the people who pretend, pretended to have seen combat, the Associated Press owes not just the, the men who pretend that they saw service, but their families, because they don't know if their father or husband is going to come home. They, a lot of times these guys get punched for pretending to have been uh, in Afghanistan and they go to the hospital for a day. You know, uh, AP owes this guy uh, uh, an apology. Uh, by the way, he wouldn't lie about his service because it's against the law. I think it's against the law. Well, at least it was, it used to be against the law. The Stolen Valor Act was passed back in 2005. It was signed into law in 2006 by President George W. Bush, who pushed that through Congress. He made it a crime for anyone to falsely claim heroics on the battlefield. Didn't want anyone lying about the war he lied about to get us into. He literally, George Bush, I don't know if you remember, but George W. Bush, piece of shit, 
lied us into Iraq and Afghanistan, right? He lied. People forget that he lied us into Afghanistan because the Taliban didn't attack us on 9-11. Al-Qaeda worked out of Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the hills of Afghanistan. So he lied. Uh, And then he introduced the Stolen Valor Act of 2005 to make sure nobody can lie about the war except him. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court overturned the Stolen Valor Act of 2005, claiming it violated the First Amendment. So it's now legal once again to claim you fought in Afghanistan and Iraq in case, you know, the weekend's coming up and you get in the bars and you want to get laid. Uh, yes, J.R. Majewski, he's a rapper also. I I hope he raps when he gets elected. I hope he's going to rap. He raps is I think he raps under the name. uh, What was it? Remember Biggie Smalls? I think uh, Jared Majewski's rap name is Biggie Lies. Biggie Lies. I'll be the working member of Congress. That's going to be the tip of the spear. And I'm going to turn that Green New Deal brown like the turd it is. How can you not love J.R. Majewski? Magnus Carlsen has been world chess champion since 2013. But last month, he lost a game to a much lower ranked player who has been accused of cheating by placing vibrating anal beads in his rectum, allowing his confederates watching the match to signal his best move. Vibrating anal beads to cheat at chess. Does anybody really believe that this guy is using vibrating anal beads to cheat at chess? It doesn't work. I mean, it works if you're hosting a podcast and Dan Frankenberger wants you to know someone raised their hand in the chat room and wants to talk, that would be two jolts, three jolts of the anal beads if uh, there's a written question in the Q&A, and four long jolts of the anal beads if Dan is enjoying the show and thinks I deserve a treat. No jolts, okay. All right, we're running out of time here. Uh, With Ukraine recapturing we don't have time. Let me uh, let me get to the. Uh, up, 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 um, I want to talk about. Is Grace here? I don't want to keep Grace waiting. <clears throat> yes, she's here. Dan. Grace is Grace has not arrived yet. <clears throat> okay, it's, it's one light little light touch on the vibrating anal beads. Um, let me scroll down here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, well, the UN General Assembly was Wednesday, and the leader of Jordan, there we go, King Jordan, uh, spoke to the UN General Assembly on Wednesday. Uh, King Jordan, King Abdullah II of Jordan, and he said he supports a two state solution. I don't know what country he was talking about. Two state solution. I guess he, I guess he still thinks it's 1996, and he's talking about Israel. Somebody should tell King Abdullah of Jordan that it's 2022, and the uh, King of Jordan is talking about a two state solution that is more extraordinary than his rendition sites that he's still talking about a two state solution. By the way. Jordan has extraordinary rendition sites. Before you get waterboarded, the CIA asks if you want flat or bubbly. So I want to talk about peace talks between Palestinians and Israel. They fell apart back in 2014. Now, I support a two-state solution, but this Israeli government, this Israeli government does not. This conservative Israeli Government prefers to harden the status quo, and that is not going to end well. Prime Minister of Israel, Yair Lapid, told the UN today that he too 
supports a two-state solution. And all the Palestinians have to do is put down their weapons and there will be peace. Now, there was a time when Israel was considered the underdog in all this, but for the time being, they've won. And the smartest thing for Israel to do is work towards some sort of two-state solution, because the alternative is a deepening nightmare in Gaza and the West Bank. I believe Jews need a country. I also know that anti-Semitism is on the rise around the world, and no matter what you do, it won't go away. So I support an Israeli state. But just like the way anti-Semitism isn't going to go away, the Palestinians aren't going to go away either. This can be fixed. But this Israeli government doesn't want to fix it. This Israeli government doesn't want to fix it. I don't like this Israeli government. I don't approve of this government. This Israeli government is expanding settlements in the West Bank, taking us further and further away from anything resem resembling peace. I do not approve of the Israeli government. Okay. Oh, look, it's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib again. She's a Palestinian American and a lawyer. This week, she appeared via Zoom to address activists from Americans for Justice and Palestine Action, which includes American Jews. A couple of American Jews spoke, and uh, they don't support the Israeli government. See, they, these are Jews who support Israel. They don't support this Israeli government. Also in the Zoom call were fellow Democratic Congress people, Andre Carson, Judy Chu, Betty McCollum, and Marie Newman, who's been on this show, and her husband is Jewish. See, she supports Israel. She doesn't support its government. A majority of American Jews do not support the government of Israel because a majority of American Jews want a two-state solution, which right now is all but dead because of the government of Israel, not the state of Israel, the government of Israel. The King of Jordan and the Prime Minister of Israel say they support a two-state solution the same way Pete Buttigieg says he supports Medicare for all. They believe in saying they support it, but they don't. So Rashida Tlaib, who everybody should donate to, said this to Palestinian activists yesterday. I want you all to know that among progressives, it has become clear that you cannot claim to hold progressive values, yet back Israel's apartheid government, and we will continue to push back and not accept this idea that you are progressive, progressive except for Philistine any longer. Well, she called it Philistine. <laughs> she didn't have to call it Philistine. Well, she said you can't call yourself a progressive and still support the Israeli apartheid government the Israeli apartheid government. Uh, there aren't any progressives in this coalition that's been put together, this government. They're not progressives. Why would progressives support this Israeli government? They support Israel's right to exist. They don't support this Israeli government. Well, the former head of the Democratic National Committee and genius Democrat, Democrat uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, she's a congresswoman from Florida, she said this is anti-Semitism. And Representative Jerry Nadler, who fancies himself the leader of the Jew Jewish Democratic Caucus, said the notion that one cannot support Israel's right to exist as a Jewish and democratic state and be a progressive 
is uh, nothing short of anti-Semitic. She didn't say uh, anything about supporting Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. She said she didn't support this apartheid Israeli government. Uh, that's what Debbie Schultz accused her of being, anti-Semitic. Congressman Jerry Nadler accused her of being anti-Semitic. The Anti-Defamation League accused her of being anti-Semitic. Uh, you're an anti-Semite if you say, in order to call yourself a progressive, uh, if she's saying that... Uh, that you have to reach, they are accusing her of saying you have to reject Israel's fundamental right to exist. Otherwise, you can't be a progressive. That's not what she said. She was attacking the Israeli government, not the state of Israel, which I'm sure she's no fan of. But there's a difference between attacking a government and the right of a country to exist. It would be like blaming the Anglican Church for the British genocide in Kenya to, 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 to say that she's anti-Semitic because of the Israeli government would be like blaming Anglicans for British genocide in Kenya. There's the Anglican Church, which is the official religion of Great Britain, and then there's the government. Nobody's blaming Anglicans for the treatment of the Mau Mau's. And yes, there is anti-Semitism in this world, and it's getting worse. Being against Israel's treatment of Palestinians doesn't make you anti-Semitic. It makes you pro-human rights, which is what progressives are. You can, like me, David Feldman, support Israel's right to exist and oppose the settlements in the West Bank. You can oppose the killing of Palestinian American journalists and still be a, uh, call yourself a, a Zionist. I got news for Jerry Nadler, the Anti-Defamation League, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and all the people who are calling Rashida Tlaib an anti-Semite. It's not a good idea to make this Israeli government synonymous with Judaism and the state of Israel. It's not a good idea to accuse anyone who doesn't support this Israeli government as anti-Semitic. It's not good. It's not good for the Jews in Israel or America. Rashida Tlaib is a great congresswoman who deserves our support. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Jerry Nadler, the Anti-Defamation League, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz should be very, very careful throwing the term anti-Semitism around. If anyone who disagrees with the Israeli government is an anti-Semite, then everyone is an anti-Semite, including me, and I'm not anti-Semitic, and I recognize Israel's right to exist. The majority of American Jews would be deemed anti-Semitic by these standards because they do not support this Israeli government. American Jews and many, not the majority, but almost half of Jews in Israel do not like what they see going on in Gaza and the West Bank. This government in Israel barely got elected. So there are a lot of people, a lot of Jews in Israel, who do not like the Israeli government. That doesn't make them anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is a powerful accusation. The Anti-Defamation League, Jerry Nadler, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz are diluting its meaning, and they should shut the fuck up. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. And by the way, anybody who disagrees with me is anti-Semitic. You're anti-Semitic if you don't agree with me. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who runs Meta, 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 and Facebook, 
has lost $70 billion worth of wealth in the past year. He's lost $70 billion. Wow. I know the feeling. There are uh, two people won the $1.337 billion Mega Millions prize jackpot. They're keeping it anonymous. It's the largest jackpot ever in American history. Two people won. Uh, they're going to have to split $1.337 billion. That sucks. So, yeah, see, that's why I don't play the lottery. So, you, what, you get like $600 million instead of $1.337 billion. It's not worth it. The number of people worth $50 million has spiked to a record high. How many people around the world do you think are worth $50 million or more? 40,000. There are 40,000 people on this planet who need to be punched in the face. If you live in Alaska today, or no, Tuesday, you got $3,000 dropped into your bank account. If you live in Alaska, they give you $3,000 a year. There's a universal basic income. It's from uh, oil, you know, but still you get 3,000 bucks uh, to live in Alaska. Uh, I get paid $6,000 not to live in Alaska. I don't wanna explain why, but Trump Support among Republicans has slipped five points in the past month. That's according to a new survey. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's approval rating is the highest it's been since last December. That's according to USA Today. If Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump competed face to face in a douchebag off in Florida, who do you think would win? DeSantis. Ron DeSantis tops Trump by eight points. Is it eight points? I think it's eight points. Is that what it says? Yeah, eight points. He would win a douchebag off in Florida. So DeSantis is more popular than, uh, than Donald Trump right now. DeSantis is being sued by civil rights groups because of his taking illegal, they're not illegals, undocumented migrants and flying them to places like Martha's Vineyard. Some of the migrants were flown to Martha's Vineyard are now filing a class action suit against Ron DeSantis, but Ron DeSantis dismisses these lawsuits, calling them, quote unquote, political theater. And if there's one thing Ron DeSantis doesn't approve of, it's political theater. Mitch McConnell says it's a good idea to ship migrants to blue states. He says he has no problem with Ron DeSantis doing this. Meanwhile, his super PAC is no longer pumping money into the Senate race in Arizona, where Blake Master is running. But uh, McConnell is all in on Herschel Walker. He's hosting a fundraiser this week, I think tonight, for Georgia Senate candidate Herschel Walker, who is not too bright. And he's running against a really great guy, right? Senator Warnock, Raphael Warnock. But uh, you would think Raphael Warnock would have no problem defeating Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker is doing well in the polls in Georgia. Some of the polls show him leading Raphael Warnock. I will not play any video of Herschel Walker. I, I get all these clips of him uh, suffering from CTE. I just think it's cruel to, to play anything of Herschel Walker. Mike Franken, no relation to Al Franken, is running for Senate in Iowa. No relation to Al Franken. Mike Franken was accused of forcibly kissing a staffer and it was looked into the police say there's nothing there ron johnson is the senator from wisconsin he's running against mandela barnes he's the democrat the lieutenant governor of wisconsin 
And Mandela Barnes in the latest USA Today poll is leading Ron Johnson by one point. That looks good. And in Texas, the Dallas Morning News has a poll out showing Beto O'Rourke trailing uh, Governor Greg Abbott by nine points. Not good. And a new poll shows that a majority of Republican voters want to make Christianity the official religion here in the United States. They want they want to get rid of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, and they want to declare this is the majority of Republicans. They want to make Christianity the official religion. I wonder where these Republicans we get this idea from other than listening to every single Republican in Congress and in the Senate. That is a pretty fright. That is frightening. That is absolutely frightening. Bill Maher gave an interview with Variety, and he says, woke baggage is Democrats' biggest problem. He says the biggest problem facing Democrats going into the midterms is woke baggage. And he says, Democrats need to stop talking about pregnant men. Wow. Bill Maher just gets smarter and smarter. He has his finger on the pulse of America because all I, all I talk about, I'm a Democrat, is pregnant men. And all my Democratic friends, all we talk about is pregnant men. And Bill Maher is so smart. He's so right. That's all Bernie Sanders talks about. That Joe Biden, if he talks, if Joe Biden talks about pregnant men one more time, I'm going to leave this country. You know, he could, there are all these things that Joe Biden could talk about, right? You know, uh, Ukraine, he could talk about inflation. Joe Biden could be talking about the environment. He could be talking about protecting the right to an abortion. But now all Joe Biden talks about is pregnant men. Who is Bill Maher hanging out with? What, what Democrats is he hanging out with who are talking about pregnant men? And as I mentioned earlier, Roseanne Barr uh, has joined Fox Nation and we'll be doing a comedy special for Fox Nation because comedians are so smart. We should listen to comedians like Bill Maher and Rose, Roseanne Barr because they're the canaries in the coal mine. And by that, I mean they have brains the size of canaries. Uh, we should listen to comedians. <laughs>